The community I'm going to study in this presentation is the drag queens community. To start with, this is a series of half drag portraits made by the New York based photographer Leland Bobby, who called it half drag, a different kind of a beauty. Leland Bobby explained his passion for presenting such portraits. He says, with these images, my intention is to capture both the male and the alter ego female side of these subjects in one image, in order to explore the crossover between males and females and to break down the physical barriers that separate them. This in turn questions the normative ideas about gender and gender fluidity. Through the power of hair and makeup, these men are able to completely transform themselves and find their female side while showing their male side. Leland Bobby's words explain my interest in such community too. But I'm not only interested in questioning the normative ideas about gender, but also in exploring how do members of the drag queens community present their social identities and how they do that linguistically. The term drag queen was first recorded in 1870 to refer to actors dressed in women's clothing. The term drag queen occurred in Polary, a subset of English slang that was popular in gay communities in the early 20th century. A slang that I'm going to examine in the next slides. The word drag means women's clothes, while queen is related to the old English word queen that means woman. Drag queens as Rusty Barrett, a linguist who was interested in gay and drag queens communities, has argued that drag queens are confused with other social groups such as transsexuals, cross-dressers, and female impersonators. But the difference between drag queens and other social groups mentioned by Rusty Barrett is the difference between gender crossing and gender passing. Gender crossing means to use the style of the other gender to present oneself. It means the stylization of the self. But they do not pass to be women like the other social groups. The famous drag queen RuPaul said, I do not impersonate females. I do not dress like a woman. I dress like a drag queen. In a book called Language and Sexuality by Don Colick and Deborah Cameron, gender crossing was explained as a source of signaling non-heterosexual identity. Drag queens are examples of gender crossing by adapting linguistic features that are associated with women, such as wide pitch range and swoopy intonation, but still use their own dialect of gay speak. In another book that is called the Drag Queen Anthology, drag was explained as not just a private cross-dressing, and it is not publicly passing for a member of the opposite gender as the gender passing in other social groups mentioned by Rusty Barrett. And it is not a form of transitioning for people planning to change gender forever. So gender crossing is different from gender passing. Gender passing means the total change of the gender to another one. Gender passing was explained by Don Kulik in a study he made in 1998 about travesties or cross-dressers in Brazil. He did a study about a group of people called travesties. The, travesti the travesties do much more 
than cross dress. They start using cosmetics and they grow their long hair and wear whatever makes them look feminine at the age of eight. Then they travel to the city and learn about the use of silicon and other oestrogen based hormones and start to use them to pass to be complete women. The next point is about the drag queen's names. The drag queen's names have different types. There are the satirical names that play on words such as misunderstood, or names that reflect extravagance and the glamour like the lady chablis, and other names may have cultural or geographical significance such as Shakida or Miss Cucupero. But there are also names that are feminine form of the, the male name of the drag queen or the names that are given by the drag mother. Drag queens do different activities like for example the lip syncing performance, dancing, performing in gay bars, hosting in nightclubs and in private parties. Drag queens do drag for different reasons. Some of them as a means of self-exploration, just as uh, Leland Bobby said, to explore their female side. Some of them do drag for performance, so they use clown values such as exaggeration, such as parody, in order to provoke humor, joke, and in order to make uh, a comic effect. Some of them use drag to make a cultural or a political statement. In this slide, in a book called the Drag Queen Anthology, we find explanation of the drag queen as performance. So in this book, they, they say that drag queens do drag as performance. Drag's core elements are performance and parody. Drag exaggerates gendered dress and mannerisms with enough little incongruities to show the otherness of the drag artist. In the exaggeration lies the parody. Drag is a performance because it needs an audience to appreciate the underlying joke. The joke is that a man can be a woman or a woman a man convincingly enough. The joke in drag is to set up femininity or masculinity as pure performance, as exaggerated gender display, and then to cut them down as pretense after, after all. As I said, for some other drag queens, they do drag in order to create a gender blurred sexual identity, and by that, to present a cultural statement or a political statement about or to take a stance about something. For example, one of the famous drag queens called Anna Livia stated in her book in 2002 that drag queens intend to perform femininity ironically by talking like a woman when I am actually a man. I communicate a critical stance towards heterosexual masculinity. But even though drag can be done by different sexualities and genders and we can find drag kings who are females performing the male gender, drag queen's performance is a very important and fascinating aspect of the gay culture and community. Now, in order to study how does language construct a specific community, it should be noted that some specific notions should be studied in relation to language. In this case, I'm going to mention some variationist approaches to language and gender than language and sexuality. The first point that should be discussed here is the difference between sex and gender and sex and sexuality. So the first step is to decouple 
sex, gender, and sex, sex and sexuality. Sex means the biological notions of male and female, while gender means the cultural notions of femininity and masculinity. So sex means the biological, male or female, while gender means the socially constructed identity. For the other two terms, sex and sexuality, sex means the act, while sexuality means the socially constructed identity also. What should be kept in mind here is that in some cases the practice of being feminine gender identity <coughs> doesn't match the cultural notion of femininity or the biological feminine. The first approach to language and gender is sexism and dominance. The approach of sexism and dominance traces the way that language is sexist and indicates the inequality of men and women, especially that women are inferior to men. Semantic derogation is an example of sexism and dominance approach to language. This approach also treats language used by women or describes the language used by women as powerless. It is an idea that Robin Lakoff in 1975 presented with examples of women's use of hedges, super polite forms, question tags, and hypercorrect grammar. The second approach that helps us to understand the relation between gender and language is that each gender has a different interactional style, as if both men and women are from two different planets. This idea was presented by Deborah Tenen in 1990, who wrote about gender lects, which means that there are different ways of speaking according to gender. In her study, men from Mars and women from Venice. Deborah Tannen mentioned that women's wave talk is called women's rapport talk, which means that women ask more questions, use positive minimal responses, inclusive pronouns, and they are interrupted more by men, while men, men's way of talk is called men's report talk, which means that men interrupt more they challenge what they are listening to and ignore what they disagree with. And they try all the time to control the topic of the discussion. They use more directives and statements. For this approach, both genders learn socially to communicate and talk. And that is not a biological way of speaking. So the second approach that is gender lacks and difference interprets the differences between the genders' ways of talk as differences, not as dominance um, the difference. The cultural myths and stereotypes are what control our thinking about proper men's and proper women's talk. But, we will, but what you will notice going through out this presentation is that the two approaches that were trying to explain the different genders talk, which are the sexism, dominance, and the gender lacks difference approaches, do not apply to the case of drag queens. So I will concentrate on another approach, that is the third approach, which deals with gender as a performance and as a repetitive action that makes us believe that those performances of gender are natural and biological. But in reality, the ways both genders are performed are culturally identified and not biologically constructed. As early as 1949, Simone de Beauvoir, in the book called The Second Sex, has observed that one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. This is the core idea of gender as performance. This means that gender is socially constructed 
and that by do doing some actions or using specific tone or wearing a makeup and by doing that repetitively a cultural construction of that specific gender is made so to be born with the correct reproductive uh, organs doesn't make any female a woman being a woman is culturally learned and not something biologically innate. To finish this slide and to conclude with, language doesn't just reflect society and doesn't just index social identities, but it reproduces society and creates social identities so that men and women choose a specific talking style to demonstrate their gender identity. But there are some people who use gender crossing and style mixing, such as drag queens, to perform their social positions in the society, and that what makes the idea of gender as performative so clear. So learning how to become a woman differs according to time and place. What was considered to be a specific gender marker in the past may have changed today and doesn't indicate specific gender. For example, having long hair is a gender marker for women and short hair is for men. But today these are not indexed or they do not index the same genders as in the past. In this slide, we find an idea about performativity. The idea that Judith Potler presented in her book Gender Trouble in 1990. Judith Butler explains gender as a performative. She means that gender is not viewed as a stable, prediscursive construct residing in individuals. Rather, it emerges in discourse and in other semiotic practices. So in other words, individuals do not simply act out pre-existing gender, they are always actively involved in the doing of gender. Cameron also in 2008 explained or supported also the idea of gender as performative. She says that what characterizes the understanding of femininity and masculinity is the pluralizing of femininities and masculinities. So attention turned to the various ways that linguistic resources could be deployed in producing a wide range of femininities and masculinities in different contexts and communities of practice. So the idea here is that even the most normative of identities are discursively produced and require repeated iteration. In the next video, Judith Butler explained the core idea of this presentation, which is the performativity and fluidity of gender. And in the other two video sequences, there are two examples of people performing gender. In the first one, boys who are performing the female gender, and in the second one, girls who are performing the male gender. Language and sexuality is also a very important step towards the understanding of drag queens community. So in dealing with sexuality, we should carry in mind that sexuality like gender is cultural, cultural rather than a purely natural phenomenon. In their book, Language and Sexuality, Don Kulik and Deborah Cameron argued that Language is the most powerful definitional representational medium available to humans. Shapes our understanding of what we are doing and of what we should be doing. When we do sex and sexuality, the language we have access to in a particular time and the place for representing sex and sexuality exerts a significant influence on what we take to be possible, what we take to be normal, and what we take to be desirable. So the relationship between ways of speaking and the sexual identity presented is very fluid. In a study done by Kira Hall in 1995 called All Talk But No Action, a study about phone sex workers, Kira Hall described the phone sex workers as prof 
professional fantasy makers and described sexuality as a linguistic accomplishment. She found that workers adopt different voices at work and different styles and races at work and that they were able to perform different sexual identities. Some heterosexual people perform homosexual and vice versa. And this is what she called cross-expressing. She means that people style themselves linguistically to perform different sexual identities, sometimes very different identities from their real-life identities. And the drag queens is another case of it cross-expressing, in which a specific person, a man or a homosexual, let's say, with a specific sexual orientation, performs a specific sexual identity, not only physically by dress crossing, but also linguistically by adapting distinguished stereotypes to index and signal a specific sexual identity. In dealing with language and sexuality, what we are investigating here is not how speakers communicate their sexual desire, but on how do speakers employ the language to signal their homosexuality, homosexuality, and that that is what we mean by sexual identity. In order to investigate the drag queens community, which is a very important aspect of gay communities, I'm going to start to trace back the studies that analyzed gay language, which, which is one of the examples of lavender language. According to Bill, to Bill Leap, coordinator of the, twen of the 10th Annual American University Conference on Lavender Languages and Linguistics, a conference in which scholars, scholars and linguists gather annually in Washington, D.C. To, di to discuss issues related to lavender linguistics. Bill Lepp believes that homosexuals communicate with each other in ways that are different from the linguistic practices of non-gay identified persons. And the use of the color lavender is often used to identify gay-friendly environments. And in order to uh, surround gay issues. Um, the term lavender languages here is used for issues relating to the pronunciation, vocabulary, and meaning in the language of the gay community. So lavender language is a special dialect and vocabulary used by the com gay community. And in the Cambridge Advanced Learners Dictionary, it was identified as words, phrases, and ways of speaking used by gay people. So the lavender language functions as a kind of homosexual code characterized by acronyms, plays on words, and double meanings only intended to be understood by the gay community. The studies of the gay language had gone through different stages. The first stage 1920s to 1940s, homosexuality was regarded as a pathology, a type of psychological disorder. And the interest about the language of homosexuality was an interest about the vocabulary and gender inversion used by the gay community. And the interest in the language of homosexuality was for one purpose, which is in order to explain that type of pathology. The language of homosexuality in the 1940s was considered as a secret language and was recorded in a list that contains the lexical items used by the gay community in a glossary made by Gershon-Legman in 1941. But that language of homosexuality was considered to be a reflection of perverse identity at that time. The second phase was from 1950s to 1960s. It is the period when the gay liberation movements started to appear and homosexual started to appear as a social identity rather than a type of pathology. 
and the research on language of homosexuality began to be conducted by gay scholars. In the third phase, that is 1970s to mid-1990s, the old-style homosexuals are gone, and there was a new gay community that started to appear, and there was the appearance of the idea of gay speak that we are going to introduce in the next slides. The last fourth period is the 1990s, which is called the queer critic of gay liberationist politics. And we are going also to analyze what is meant by queer. The focus here shifts from seeing identity as the source of particular forms of language to seeing identity as the effect of a specific semiotic practices. These are examples of the vocabulary items collected by Legman in 1941 in his glossary, The Language of Homosexuality, an American Glossary. These are examples of language used by homosexuals who were treated as suffering from a psychological problem at that time, the period from 1920s to 1940s. The idea that gays have a secret language was dealt with as a proof of pathology, as I mentioned. And the dealing and the studies of language, the investigations of language at that time, appeared in books for psychoanalysis from which the following statement was taken, describing the homosexual as human misfits. So uh, in a book, called Cure in Psychology and Psychoanalysis from 1936, there was a quotation describing the secret code or the secret language used by gay communities at that time, which is there is a widespread use of strange slang among these human misfits. Once I heard one say that Queen over there is camping for a jam, I was puzzled. Investigation showed that neither royalty the wide open spaces nor the household delicacy were involved. Next appeared the idea that homosexual doesn't have a language of their own, but rather a gay speak, which is consisted of the voice, the gay voice, the lexicon and slang, the camp talk and the style inversion and gender crossing. We we'll start with the voice. Why gay voice? What is gay voice and why gays do use that voice? Some phoneticians have described the distinctive way in which gays speak as the voice and claim that it has some characteristics that include wide pitch range, breathiness, breathiness lengthening of fricative sounds like so and so and affrication of plosives t and d so they sound like t and t but many research suggests that the voice is a culturally recognizable phenomenon and that there is not a perfect fit between having the voice of the gay or sounding gay and being gay in a book by Don Kulik and Deborah Cameron language and sexuality Deborah Cameron and Kolek argued that not all gay men have the voice and not everyone who has the voice is gay. They said also that the fact that gays do X doesn't make X gay. An example of the gay voice and how it is culturally constructed, not just something related to gays only, the urban effeminate way in the film Brokeback Mountain introduced an idea that contradicts the stereotype of gay voice, the idea that not all gay men have the voice and not everyone who has the voice is gay. Another study has proved that the gay voice is not an indicator of gayness, but it is product by culture. By 
Those studies are mirrored and reflected in popular culture. For example, the next video is taken from Legally Blonde, the musical performance of the movie Legally Blonde, in which appears that not all gays have the voice and that the stereotypes that we relate to being a gay or, uh, or um, belonging to a gay community are culturally constructed stereotypes. It was claimed that homosexuals had their own secret slang for the following reasons. For identification, to identify each other and to communicate their preference to one another. And as an inclusion and exclusion strategy, so it is a kind of argot or jargon, so in order to mislead the outsiders. Also, it was used as a protection for their community at a time when hom homosexual activity was illegal, so they wanted to um, protect homosexuals from hostile outsiders and undercover policemen. Polary is the slang that we talked about before, and we said that the, the term drag queen was taken uh, from the polary slang. This is an example taken from a book called Parallel Lives, which is an example of the secret slang that was used by the gay community in the last 19th century. The slang was used in Britain and called Polary. It is a form of slang used by actors, circus and fairground showmen, merchant navy sailors, criminals, prostitutes, and of course the gay subculture. Polary was very famous among gays, but the gay liberationists of the 1970s viewed it as rather degrading and politically incorrect. In addition, the need for a secret subculture code declined with the legislation of adult homosexual acts in England and Wales in 1967. So as you notice here, the first paragraph is an example of a polary secret language, the gay secret language, and the second one is the translation of the words that are uh, used in polary. Another element that distinguished the gay speak was the use of feminine pronouns. In this slide, and in this slide, we are introducing the use of feminine pronouns. A very common usage in the speech of male homosexual is the substitution of feminine pronouns and titles for properly masculine ones. Male homosexuals use the term she, her, hers, miss, mother, and girl, almost never women in referring to themselves and each another. Gender inversion and the use of dim diminutives and discursive moves to index cooperation rather than competition, which is um, one of the characteristics of men's talk, and it is totally absent in the gay speak. In the next slide, there is a video made by Paul Baker. Paul Baker is uh, a British lecturer in linguistics at Lancaster University who has spent several years researching this dialect, adapting the subject as a PhD topic um, and authoring three books in the field of lavender linguistics. And this video is about the secret language polary. Polary. A framework was developed by Keith Harvey to identify camp talk, which is an element of gay speak. He claims that camp talk is a language that results from four strategies, which are paradox, that means juxtaposition of contradictory or clashing meanings. Parody, which means the stylistic and pragmatic devices that both in text and exaggerate speaker orientation to identities and social positions. Inversion, which means effects, the, the reversal of unexpected order or relation between signs. Ludicrism, which means the linguistic playfulness this means utterances that suggest the multiplicity of meaning in language. In addition to the use of aristocratic mannerism and femininity to challenge the supposed unproblematic relation between language and identity, camp talk is the new 
trend in gay speak. The point here is that Keith Harvey made the development in the analysis of the language of homosexuality. He went far away from Legman's view in 1941 of that language as a secret code and of simple use of feminine pronouns and names of substitute masculine ones through the analysis of how particular kinds of juxtaposition in language are used creatively to construct particular identities and social positions instead of just looking at gay language as a reflection of perverse identity or as an authentic display of an affirmative identity. The idea here is that the previous studies started to look at how identities are reflected in language by studying people who are known to be gays and to assume that the language used by them is authentically gay language. They started from identity to language, while the more recent studies, such as Harvey's and Barrett's studies, started to view how is language used to construct and create that non-heterosexual identity, starting from semiotic practices to create specific social positions. All of those elements mentioned by Harvey explain how is camp talk considered as a queer language funny or disruptive and disturbing. And the point here is that what makes that language queer is not being used by non-heterosexual, but its lack of respect to the truth. So the linguistic playfulness it contains plays not just with the linguistic items, but to create with a fluid identity, it plays also with the idea of the truth of what is considered to be gender. So here in Judith Butler quotation or statement, she said the effect of camp on truth is to deprive hegemonic cu culture and its critics of the claim to naturalize or essentialize identities. Considering that the drag queens are a part of the gay community, can we say that the linguistic strategies drag queens use is an example of the gay speak I discussed earlier, or are they a reflection of women's talk since that drag queens do the gender crossing and style themselves as female, or are the linguistic strategies drag queens use examples of the queer language we can assume that even though some drag queens use the gay voice, some others don't. And even though they tend to use feminine pronouns to refer to each other, they do not use the polar, polari slang, but they created a new slang for themselves, as I'm going to present in next slides. By introducing the characteristics of Robin Luck of women's language, you will notice that drag queens share many of these characteristics while differing in others. What you will notice here is that this is not the case with the drag queens who are performing a different identity through language. They use their own slang, lexicon, and ways of interaction, and their ways of talking have many differences with women's talk. Even though they are performing give a male character, they avoid using headdress, and definitely they do not use polite forms, and they are not afraid of stating their opinions directly. So even though they impersonate the female gender and some characteristics of the mentioned uh, characteristics of women's language, they do not use the women's talk and we cannot consider the drag queen's talk to be um, merely women's talk. In the next slide, we can talk about queer language. Queer language means the ways of using language that disrupted normative conventions and expectations about who could talk about sexuality and how that talk should be structured and um, constructed. Rusty Barrett suggests that the idea of the homogeneous speech community could perhaps be more accurately replaced by one of a queer community based 
on community spirit or queer cultural system since language use varies so greatly. Rusty Barrett, who analyzed stage performance by African American drag queens in 1997, argues that the key dimension in drag queens' language is the juxtaposition of linguistic registers and the styles that index socially shocking positions sometimes. According to Barrett, ladies are not expected to talk rough, but the stereotypical women's talk by Robin Lakoff that, that I stated in the previous um, uh, slides may occur with overt sexual references or the switch from a typical white woman talk to African-American vernacular English like what the famous drag queen Ro Pulse did when she switched in a television appearance to answer a question whether, whether she desired actually to be a woman. So she, she answered, no, I'm happy being a big old black man. To conclude with the gayness of the drag queen, as Barrett stated, is not signaled through discrete linguistic codes lexicon, gender, inversion, gay voice, or through discursive moves. Barrett insists that the drag queen's queerness is materialized through the co-occurrence co of linguistically and socially contradictory forms and registers, for example, hypercorrect pronunciation while uttering obscenities. In the next slide, we are going to see uh, a short video about how do drag queens speak and what do they say when they speak. These are examples of the slang used by drag queens taken from a very famous televised reality show on Logo Channel called RuPaul Drag Race. For example here you can find the word beat one's face, which is actually a compliment for a drag queen. Uh, it may appear as an insult, but in the drag queen's slang, it is a compliment. It means to apply the perfect amount of makeup. For example, in the next slide, the word fishy, which is an adjective, it means to look like a woman, not like a man dressed like a woman. And here, the most famous word is sickening. It means incredibly amazing or excessively hot. While the letter T means the truth. I want to know the T. It means I want to know the truth. The last point of this presentation is about the perception of society of drag queens. How does society see drag queens? What is fascinating here is the big change from the look in the past to homosexual as a pathology to a different way of looking at them as presenters of exotic ways of living and self-expression. For example, in this passage taken from the book called The Homosexual in America, 1951, um, written by Donald Corey, a campaigner for homophile rights. Drag queens community was described as an exotic community. In paragraph one, you can find the highlighted words and they are describing the makeup, the hair, the eyelashes uh, of the drag queens. And in the second one, he is um, using their ways of talking to each other, using the feminine pronouns to refer to each other and also the feminine names. Also Andy Warhol, who was an American artist and the leading figure in visual art movement, the pop art movement, finds that among other things, drag queens are living testimony to the way women used to want to be, the way some people still want them to be, and the way some women still actually want to be. Tyler Dane, also an American singer and songwriter, has confirmed that idea when she said, I love drag queens, they perform me better than I ever could myself. 
The strong presence of drag queens in popular culture in TV reality shows, in songs, in movies is also proof of that big change in the way that society perceives the homosexuals and especially the gays. Drag has come to be celebrated aspects of modern gay life. For example, many gay bars and clubs around the world hold the drag shows as special parties. Several international drag day holidays have been started over the years to promote the shows. In the U.S., for example, drag is typically celebrated in early March. And a televised drag competition called RuPaul's Drag Race is the most successful program on the local television network. However, for example, also the high heel drag queen race which is an informal custom to drag a queen race in Washington, D.C. that happens each year on the Tuesday before the Halloween holiday and thousands of spectators come to DuPont Circle to watch as 100 or so custom to drag queens show off their elaborate outfits and race down 17th streets and all the bars and restaurants um, prepare some special drinks and dishes